I think you saw one of my posts on Robert Mesa. Yes. And you contacted me through Instagram and yes. you developed this, you know, virtual relationship <laughs> where I ask you a lot of questions <laughs> and you give me a lot of great answers. Uh, and you provided, I think, the world the footage for the first car to flip over mm -hmm. from San Jose, which I think is incredible. Yes. Um, so let's get into it. Um, I'm here right now with, with Jerry Russell. Um, are you originally from San Jose? Yes. Okay. Born and raised? No. Moved to San Jose from the Bay Area in the early 70s, 72, 73, I moved to San Jose. Okay. So that's interesting because New Style was founded um, a few years later. Mm -hmm. um, you were one of the original members of New Style. So how did you, how did you get into that, into the low riding scene and, and getting with, uh, together with those group of guys? Well, everybody used to cruise King and Story Road. Everybody from the racers to the all kinds of cars. Everybody used to cruise out there. And uh, I was cruising out there with one of my friends one night. And I saw Andy. I think Andy had a 66 then. It was a primer 66, I think. And he was the only one in town at the time that had hydraulics on this car that I could remember. And I saw the car. And I saw the car go up and down. And so when he went and parked over there with some... More of the guys, uh, I just drove over there in my car. I, I had, back then, the style then was the big white tires with the white oval, white, white letter tires and stuff like that. And so I just went over there and I started looking at the cars and I just started talking to the guys and I said, how do you make the car, you know, how you make the car go up and down? Well, it's called hydraulics, this and that. And they had the little, and I remember what caught my eyes was the little skinny wheels on them. I went, how in the hell do they drive those cars? Those skinny wheels on them. And then when they sit the car down on the ground, I said, oh, okay, now I see why yeah. you have to have this little skinny wheel. And I just started talking to Andy, you know, and he showed me the hydraulics, <clears throat> excuse me, and stuff that he had in the trunk. Crap, total crap. Batteries all over the place, fluid all over the place and everything, but everything worked. And so we just, I just got to talking to him. He goes, yeah, you know, I do these cars over at my, my house and stuff. For my friends, I hadn't met Robert then. For my my friends and stuff, and so it was just like a hangout over at Andy's uh, house. Like all of the car guys would just like hang, hang hang out over his house. So I just started hanging out with the guys, and then I said, you know what? I think I'd like to do that to my car. What what does it take? You know, and Andy goes, well, you got to have this, you got to have that, and you got to go down to L.A. At then we were buying all it was all aircraft stuff bought at Pally's down in L.A. From the cylinders to the hoses to the pumps. And everything was all aircraft and anything. Told him, well, you got to have this and you got to have that, you know, and I said, well, you know, I think I'd like to do this to my car. And so, and he said, okay, the next time I'll go down there, I'll buy enough stuff to do your car. Man, back then it was, it was a job to lift the car. It would take about a month with all the stuff you had to do. It was all aircraft stuff. The cylinders were real huge. They were all different kinds of cylinders. You just had to trim them down and stuff and do a lot of fitting on just to get them to fit on the car. They had little tiny strokes because mm -hmm. they weren't made for cars. So you'd always buy four or five extra sets because you always bend the strokes. Sooner or later when the weight get on, they would bend. And so uh, Andy would go down there and he'd buy all the stuff from bringing it back. So we got my car. Andy did my car in the front. Then everybody was just doing their cars in the front. We got all the stuff together. It was all aircraft stuff, hoses, all the everything was sur surplus. I mean, all the hoses and stuff, they were 50, 60 years old. Uh, all the dumps, uh, everything was aircraft, fittings, everything. The hoses, it depended on what they had in stock down there. A lot of times they'd have short hoses, so you had to buy a bunch of them to put them together, to get them <laughs> to fit, to go wherever you wanted to yeah. buy, and all the fittings and stuff. And it was just a mess but everything worked, okay, once you got in there and everything worked. And at that time, everybody was mounting the pumps under the hood of the car, okay? Mm -hmm. And because it was easier to find the short hoses to go to the cylinders, okay? Oh, okay. And so everybody was mounting the pumps under the hood of the car. And they would, man, guys would have them wired in there and tied up in there and stuff, the pumps where it was, really a mess it was really archaic stuff but everything worked and so Andy goes well you know you're gonna have to buy little these little wheels too to go in your car because you're not gonna be able to sit it down so back then the Imperials and the Dukes in LA 
the uh, wheels in were the Krager SS. Those were the wheels. Those were the top of the line wheels. Now, another manufacturer called Keystone made a copy of the SS. It looked just like the SS. It just didn't have the SS cap on it. So we were buying the cheaper guys like me that didn't have the money to buy the Kragers. We were buying the Keystones that looked just like the uh, Kragers. So we bought those. We bought the 520s and everything. We got them put on the car and everything. Got the car going up and down, which was this was my first car right here. What car was that? Uh, that was the Grand Am. Okay, it was a 73 Grand Am, and we were running 14s on it with 520, mm -hmm. 14s on it. And uh, we got it done, and then Andy did my car, and then I think we did Mark's car. Mark, if I remember, Mark had a 72 Caprice, and we did Mark's car, and then I'm trying to remember who else. I think we did Rick Garcia's after that, and then... Ra Raul Reyes was around then. We did one of his cars. Robert, I can't remember the car Robert had, but I think we did Robert's car. Andy, we were doing them all at Andy's house because he was the only one that knew how to do it. And um, after a while, after we got five or six guys, Andy goes, you know what? We need to get a club started. You know, because even we would cruise together all the time, like on Friday nights, we would all meet up and meet together. And then the guys with the hydraulics, they were all cruised together at the time. And so, uh, and he goes, you know what? We should, we should start a club. I don't know how the name, I remember then most people were putting the hydraulics on the older Chevys then, the, the, the 50s, the 64s, the 63s. Andy was the first one to do it. He said, I'm going to put this on a new car. Andy had a 74 Caprice Classic. And I don't know if that's how the name New Style came along, or I don't know if that's if, if it was just a coincidence when he went to buy the plaques, it was the same name. But then I remember Andy saying that, we, we, we need to put this on new cars. That would really trip people out to have these on new cars. And so... That's when everything started. I had a 73. Hank Lopez, I think he had a 73 or 74 Caprice or Impala. I can't remember which one it was. It was a big one. It was a big body. It was black. And then I remember later on, Manuel Garcia was the first one. He had a 76 Caprice class. That was the first one with uh, L.A. Candy flake job on it. Andy's painted his, and it was multi colors too. It was multi candies too. But Manuel's was the first really official one. Bugs from LA painted it's Manuel's. Color, right? yeah. yeah. So the, the, the photo you have right here, that's mm -hmm. Andy's car, the one that's patterned? Yes. Um, yes. Might be another. Yeah, that 74. I can't, I want to say it was a Caprice. That was the first multi patterned low rider in San Jose that I can remember because Andy painted it himself. He painted that at his house or he, uh, or, okay, so you said that he also worked at a shop, right? At yeah, shop. He, uh, him and Raul Reyes had got, it was like a paint shop, paint and body shop. And I can't remember if Andy painted this then. That was a long time ago, but I know Andy painted a lot of cars at his house, okay, in the garage. And he would paint some uh, at his job too after hours I think when he worked there but he was the painter and he was the hydraulic man okay he was the only one in town so if you had hydraulics on your car Andy had to do it and that's why it was a few it was just a small group of us that had it that happened to be there so then that's why the lowriders wasn't a lot of those cars we were the only ones on that side of town that had the hydraulics on the car yeah, if Andy didn't do them you 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 didn't have them at the at, at the time he had a connection down in LA because his uh, wife Terry his first wife Terry I think her family was from the LA area so Andy knew a, a lot of people down there to get stuff. You sent me a lot of photos of the '65 that stood on its back bumper, right? Pump. Did that you, was a '66. A '66. Yeah. Did you work on that? Not that much because they were they were doing that at Andy's shop up here in San Jose and I was running a shop down in Fresno. Okay. So I was back and forth, but I didn't hardly have anything to do with that car. If I had anything to do with it, it was just helping helping, helping them get it ready to take 
to the L.A. show, to the big L.A. show. Most of the guys, I was up there, we were dabbling back and forth, but most of that work on that car was done up up here in San Jose while I was down in Fresno. Okay. So how, how did that work out with the... Um with the Fresno shop. So Andy had his Andy's Hydraulics in San Jose. And then was the second shop the Fresno shop? The second shop, I think, was the Fresno shop. And then the Stockton shop. And then he had one in Arizona, I think, somewhere. He wind up having, I think he wind up having four or five locations. But I can't remember them all. But I do remember definitely the Fresno store in the Stockton store because both of our buddies, Joe, who's known as who was known as is still known as Pineapple, ran the shop up in Stockton for him. Okay. So he was around too. He had just moved up from the LA area and he had a Monte Carlo too. And he eventually left and started his own club. New New Wave was his club. So Joe started that club so uh, eventually. But yeah we 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 were we were all in there together. I don't know. I think Joe was still active in New Wave when he was running the store for Andy up in Stockton. I'm not sure, but but I know that we all kept contact with all the guys that were in the club. Uh, what year was that 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 happened? Because this is almost. It sounds like when hydraulic shops start to take off. Andy, right? Andy was the innovator of that dude. Andy was the innovator. He he started his first shop downtown here in San Jose and everybody laughed at him. Nobody's going to come in and buy that crap, man. That's, uh, that's all crap. And Andy, I, I don't know what you've heard, but he was an innovator of shops yeah. that I know of in this area. Now, I don't know about other areas because we didn't venture out that much. We just went to L.A. from that. But in San Jose, Andy was a man that, get, that had the, the idea of, man, we should start selling this stuff. You see, when we started, it was only aircraft stuff to be used. And if you got a hydraulic pump, there were tailgates. I'm not going to go into detail on how those pumps were acquired off the tailgates, but there were guys that you could contact that you could get a tailgate pump when Andy figured out, hey, we could use the tailgate pumps instead of using the Aircraft pumps, which were the Adels, the Pescos, the Bridgeports, those are all aircraft pumps. Those those pumps actually came off of airplanes, and they used them to transfer the fuel from wing to wing. And then Andy uh, said, hey, that I can remember. Andy was one to say, man, we could use the pumps off of the tailgates. Do you know how much weight those tailgates lift up and down? Which, if you will look now at any of the companies that have trucks that have tailgates on them, you see how they have the tailgate cage constructed now. That was because of, it was, it was, very, it was very, very easy to get those pumps off of the truck then. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll definitely get into the, the hydraulic tech and kind of the, the switch from aircraft to, to lift gates or tailgates. But So I'm guessing that the, that the car that stood on back bumper, the 66, and mm -hmm. then the car that was flipped over, which a 65? Right. I think it was a 65 Malibu, I yeah. think, a 65, 64 Malibu. So those both had to have been on, on lift gates, tailgate pumps, Yes, right? yeah. yeah. See, but the trucks that, the uh, pumps that they fit on the tailgates, those are very, very low output pumps as far as pressure, okay? Uh, because the pump assemblies inside the pump, they come in different sizes, so you can get those pumps on the tailgates. They run on one battery. They're 12 volt, slow, low voltage, high output pumps. They'll push a lot of weight, but they run slow, mm -hmm. which is how, why they have to have them to go on the tailgates like that. But once people started getting those pumps and taking those pumps apart, they could see the different sizes in the pumping gears in there, okay? The bigger the size of the pumping gear, the faster the output. The more gallons per minute it will put out. Now, if you multiply the power source, now it's putting more gallons per minute out faster. Yeah. Instead of one battery, you got four batteries hooked up to it. Mm -hmm. 
So that's how that came along as far as figuring out. And then somebody, I don't know who, probably Andy figured out that, well, we can order. We have the manufacturer of the pump right here. Why can't we see if we can order bigger pumping gears that a pump faster? Because some of the, they used to call them uh, mini gates. They used to call them low pressure. They were constructed different. Those were constructed different because the pump was more compact. So the output had to be more. So those were be actually better for the cars than the bigger pumps on the bigger trucks. Yeah. And you just go back. It just depends on which pump was available when you got ready to do, do your car. Because no one, you have to remember back then, there was no Google. There was no YouTube. <laughs> you know, so n no one had an idea. Hey, let's contact the manufacturer and, and see what the different pump sizes and pump things uh, we can get to do what we want to do. And, man, they were expensive then, man. Shoot, a pump was probably five, 600 bucks then. So that, that's interesting because in, in um, Andy's ads, at, at one point, he starts to advertise, like, this is the hopping pump, right? And so he must have been exactly what you were saying. He's taking the, basically the housing of, of a tailgate, but then the internals he's changing out, and he's selling that as, okay, this is the hopper pump. Well, that's where the innovation came. Yeah, that's crazy. Which, which, which was sharp of the dude, man, because then you start thinking, well, let's talk to the manufacturer. These guys, let's talk to them and see what we can do because most of the stuff when I started, it was all trial and error, man. A lot of times stuff would break and there was nobody to give us answers. We'd have to wait for Andy to go to L.A. to talk to those guys down there that knew what they were doing to give us the answers and give us the parts to come back and try and fix our car because there was no, we, we, we didn't have any information out there and no, no one thought about going to the manufacturer because first of all, it was illegal to have these on your cars according to the California vehicle code. Mm -hmm. So uh, we wasn't gonna go into the store advertising uh, what we were doing our cars and especially <laughs> with so many liftgate pumps being stolen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we, we didn't want to advertise what we we were doing with our cars, so it was trying to get as much information as you can without being noticed. And the guys down in L.A., man, those those guys knew their stuff, man. Yeah. They were way ahead of us when it, it, those guys started in the 30s and the 40s down here doing that stuff. Yeah, so, the cars. Yeah, so they were they were way way ahead of us. Andy was a big innovator in taking this pump and let's do something better to it where we get more output and more this and more that and more that out of these, out of the manufacturer's pumps and see if we can't get the manufacturer to make what we want. Right. And I think as we all know, a lot of people started to copy what Andy's formula, what he was doing, right? Then other shops started to pop up. Yeah. And we used to have to use aircraft cylinders. And then there's a company down in LA that started making smaller cylinders to fit in cars. There were two... There were two different kind. Uh, God, I can't remember the name of it. The, uh, they made some that did not come apart. They were one-time one cylinders, but they were constructed to go in, in cars. Okay. The, the Pally Reds? No. No. The, the, uh, the Pally Reds came later. Okay. And I think Andy had something to do with that because when they started making DNA cylinders, mm -hmm. uh, I think Andy had something to do with that, with those constructions. The, Thing with the Pally's Reds and the DNA, there were cylinders then you could take apart and you could reseal them. The first, I'm trying to remember the first ones we got, they were gold and they looked just like the DNA cylinders, but they didn't come apart. They were all sealed and you could use them and once the seals went out on them, you had to throw the cylinders away. But they were a lot smaller to put it. They were easier to put in cars then so you didn't have to make big giant cutouts in your car. But I can't remember the name of those cylinders for the love of me but i know when pally's reds and the dnh came out they were made for cars yeah. they were actually made for cars and you could take them apart and you could resell them then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's a documentary where it, it shows andy in his shop I mean, you might remember that and he kind of brings a pump puts it on the table and then he shows the part the cylinders and all that so that that must have been a pally red that he was showing off because it was a red cylinder yeah to a, see to the cup. see and andy's uh shop and all his shop he he so DNH Reds, and I'm sure the DNH has something to do in there with the name Douglas. 
because I know Andy had something to do with the construction. Andy went down there, went down there to the machine shop and told them what he want, how he wanted to sell. And at the time, those were the best cylinders on the market, the DNA threads. And so were, were cars hopping on those too? So yes. like was, was pumped hopping on that? Is that yes. Wow. Everything, and that 66 that Andy Nim built, mm -hmm. that was his main sales pitch. Everything in that car, you could walk in any one of the shops and buy it right off the shelf. That was the marketing right there? Yes. There was nothing in that car that was custom built when it came to hydraulics. You could walk in any store and buy it. Smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very sharp. Your, yeah. Man, the dude <laughs> is sharp, man. The dude is sharp. I have to give him a bunch of credit. And people right now that are low riding, they have no idea. I'm sure a lot of them do, but the history of the innovation, uh, man, Andy, the dude was way, way, way ahead of his time when it came to this stuff. Wow. Yeah. And you were there picking up all that knowledge too, right? Because you were installing and Just just running shops trying i started my big install my car here when i got my car here i lived here in san jose the first new style club dance we were able to have at the fairgrounds i was there with my car like everybody else and when i got ready to leave that night uh, i raised up my car and it had a leak in one of the hoses mm -hmm. I couldn't see where it was. Me and my buddy, we were there together. Uh, I couldn't see where the leak was in the hose. Raised up the hood. You could raise up the car. You could hear it seeping down, seeping, seeping down. But we couldn't see it. So I was trying to run my We didn't have flashlights. I was trying to run my uh, fingers along the lines and see which one was leaking. And uh, I couldn't find it. So my buddy was in the car and he would hit the switch. He would tap the switch just to get enough pressure in it for it to leak. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for the sound, looking for the sound. And he tapped the switch one time and I had my finger right over the hole and an injected hydraulic fluid right in my finger. Everybody then had extra hoses. We had, we'd go in the trunk, change out the hose right there. We went on to the dance and had a good time the next night. That night, my finger was killing me, man. It was aching bad. When I went home that night, I soaked it in something my mom had made for me. She, she, she looked at it. She goes, oh, oh, yeah, I need to soak it. So I soaked it. And the next morning I got up, it was, it was worse. It was killing me, driving me to the point. So I went to emergency. And there was a young intern there. And he came in and he looked at it. He asked me what happened. And I told him what happened. And he said, what kind of fluid was it? And I said, it was transmission fluid. Because that's all everybody ran there. They just ran transmission. I said, it was transmission. It was automotive transmission fluid. He said, wait, right there. He said, I'm, I made a call. He said, you need to go over there right away. Ask for this doctor to go in the emergency room. You need to talk to him. And I'm wondering, what, what the heck's going on? He goes, this is serious. You really need to go over there. He goes, I, I can't do anything for you here. He goes, you need to go over there and see this doctor. So I drove over there. I had my finger wrapped up. I drove over there. I went in. I talked to the doctor. He told me, and the doctor looked at me. The chemicals that's in transmission fluid, he goes, they're corrosive to human tissue. Every place that transmission fluid, every open tissue that transmission touches, it eats it up like cancer. 20 minutes later, the nurses come in, they give me on the table, they get an IV going in. And I, what the heck's going on? He goes, the doctor talked to you, the doctor talked to you. About that time, another guy came in. He had a full ski suit on, like he had been skiing. And he came in, he introduced himself and said, I'm a surgeon this and that, and he was looking at my finger, he was examining my finger and stuff, he said, yeah, they called me in, I was on a ski trip and stuff up in Tahoe and, and this and that, and now I'm thinking, man, this is really serious, okay? And so he said, let me go get out of these clothes and I'll be back, I'll talk to you. So he comes back in and he said, did the intern explain to you about the corrosive part of the fluid? And I went, yeah, kinda, he goes, well, that's very bad. He said, the end of your finger right there, is gone. I'm gonna have to take it off. He said, possibly your finger up to your hand, he said, and it don't look good for your arm, maybe up to your elbow. I said, what? He said, no, I'm serious. Five minutes later, they had me in the operating room. The prettiest sight 
I can remember in my life, other than my kids being born, was when I woke up and I saw they, they, they had my arm up like this under arrest, and it was all wrapped up all the way up here. That was a beautiful sight, dude. <laughs> How old were you at this time? Man, 24, 25, I guess. Damn. 24, 25. All of that from a hydraulic hose. From a little hydraulic hose. That's crazy. Dude, I was in the hospital for seven days. And my buddy, the one that was with me, he came to see me. And I told him when I was in the hospital, I said, I want you to go home, tell, him, tell my mom to give you some money, and go down to the hydraulic supply store and buy all brand new hydraulic hoses. I ain't put no more surplus stuff on my car. Yeah. Nothing. And hoses then was, was high, man. And then when I got out of the hospital, he and I, when we started working on my car, then that's when I started thinking, you, you know what? Everybody used to mount their pumps under the hood because it was cheaper to buy battery cable to go from the pump to the battery or to go all the way to the trunk. When I got out of the hospital and got ready to buy my new hoses, I said, you know what? I'm going to mount my pump in the trunk. It's a lot more room to work with. And I'll just run the hose to the front up to the cylinders. And then the pump is right there by the batteries and er everything is, is, is close. I'm not saying I innovated that, but I am saying I was the first one to do it on my car. Mm. And then I started seeing it on other cars. And people never had battery racks then. The b batteries were thrown in a trunk and they were tie strapped or or the big rubber bungees that their truck drivers used. They had them all gathered up then, and I remember them sliding around in the trunk when you go around corner and stuff. And when we got ready to move my pump to the trunk of the car, I said, you know what, we need to make a, a something, a rack or something to hold these batteries in. You know, they have the racks on the trunk, the trucks with the tailgates. You could see the battery sitting in the racks, you know. But back then, nobody were was welders or fabricators, nothing like that. So I made my rack out of wood mm -hmm. and I mounted it to the trunk, okay, the wood to the trunk for my batteries. Back then, nobody was running 10 batteries. We was running two, maybe three batteries mm -hmm. then, okay. On a single pump? Yeah. And so after I did that, I got my batteries in there. I got my pump back there and I went and bought the new hoses. And I really couldn't tell you where it went to from then, but I know everybody started putting their pumps in the trunk then. Yeah. Because man, when we had them under the hood, I don't know if Robert remember, man, a lot of times they'd be all tie strapped under the hood and wired to the uh, radiator support and stuff and the pumps would yeah. be, and, and a lot of times guys be in there with hammers banging to fend the wells, trying to get them to fit down there. It was just a mess, man. But uh, when people start putting them in the trunk, you got a lot of room. You make brackets for them and everything. Yeah. You know, so everybody's awesome. doing that, right? Yes. It's really the, the main way to do it. Oh, yeah, for sure. So for someone who doesn't know anything about how a car can go up and down, um, you know, you've talked about there's there's a pump that pushes fluid around. You have hoses that you're running from basically the trunk up into the cylinder. Um, can you talk about, like, the, the dumps, that I, how that actually works and how you would go about installing the cylinders into the front and the back of the car? Okay. Well, see, when people first started, the tailgate pumps, I can remember, they used to have manual levers on the side of them to where you could release the pressure mm -hmm. to let the tailgate down or to release the pressure that the pump had built up. They, they had manual levers on them. So a lot of guys, then they would run wires in their car. <laughs> <laughs> they would run wires in their car back to the manual levers to where they could release them. Um, I... I'm not sure who came up with the idea in San Jose about dumps. I'm sure it started down in L.A. somewhere because the valves that they used, that the, they were using, the aircraft valves that we were using for dumps then, they were directional. Most of them were directional valves. They would change the direction of the fluid flow, mm -hmm. okay? So they were perfect for the aircraft pumps because a lot of the aircraft pumps were used to transfer the fuel from wing to wing on the airplanes. Right. So they would have the valve in there, so they would pump so much fuel to this wing and then they 
activate the valve and it change direction of the fluid and it pump another direction the other way. Right. So it goes in one side and then it can be split out two yes. sides on the other side. Yes. Of the duct. Then it has a return side. So once the pressure builds up, if you activate that valve, which is the dump, if you open it, then it releases the pressure. So then that came along. The air, the aircraft dumps. Okay, that's what we used to call them dumps because they would dump the car down. So right. they call them dump. And then somebody said, well, once you build all that pressure up and you hit the switch, the car is just going to slam. And then somebody said, well, we need to put a control valve on the return side to where we can regulate the speed that the pressure comes back out of the valve, mm -hmm. which they start calling them slowdown valves. Yeah. That's what they start calling them. That's actually what they were. And then the first one looked like water faucets. Now that you have on your house for the, we use those for a long time. And <laughs> then we uh, start uh, figuring out we could use the aircraft when you go get the aircraft stuff, they had them in the surplus then. And there were all kinds. There's all kinds. There's needle valves. There's all different brands, makes and stuff to do that. And all it does, it controls the flow of a fluid running in one direction. So when you're when you're cutting out the, the front of the cars back then, right, you're using torches? Torch. torch. Yeah. Torch. And you'd have to remove the shock in the front because the cylinder would replace the shock. Okay. In the rear, you'd have to leave the shock on, but where the rear spring, and the cars that had springs, where the rear spring was, there was a spring perch up on top that held that spring. So you would cut a hole in that spring perch to put the cylinder in the rear and then cut the spring in half or almost down to nothing to where the travel of the cylinder would compensate for the length of the spring. So then you was using the cylinder as a control spring, actually. Mm -hmm. The shock was still connected, so the car wouldn't flop around in the back end. The rear end would stay stable. But the cylinder was being used as, as a controllable spring. Right. So before the, the Pally Reds and the D&H, you're cutting what, like four-inch holes? <laughs> Huge holes, man. <laughs> Whatever aircraft yeah. cylinders you could find to go back there and they wouldn't last the frames would get all tweaked and the guys would cut too much and they cracked the frames and it, it, it was just a mess then trying to put those aircraft cylinders or, or try and find some aircraft cylinders that were small enough for you to use because the cylinders that we use they they activated the wing flaps on the planes and the landing gear mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh they were monsters. Uh, yeah, and they were all different sizes. Length sizes and all the a little sh strokes that would come out, they would be different diameters too. Yeah. So you just had to try and find a pair of something that you thought you could uh, use. We'd, we'd have to trim because they had um, mount perches on the, on the sides of them. We had to trim those off and grind them down to get them to fit. It was a mess. Damn. Yeah, it was That's crazy. Yeah. But I mean, even, even just being like you said, innovative enough to to think about putting those in there. Um, so if we look at, at modern hydraulics, right, you you cut the front A-arm, right, like with the hole. You you cut the frame. So what you do in the front is you do the same thing. You take out the shock. You cut a hole for the cylinder to fit where the shock was, okay, and then you cut the spring in half or less than half, and now you have a controllable shock. Because on a regular car with shocks, if you press down it, you can bounce the car. Right. You have travel. So if you take out the shock and replace it with a cylinder, cut the spring in half, now you have a controllable shock yep. in the front. Now, when the car goes down, the A-arm up on top has travel. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, depending on the car, you have to trim that A-arm out to compensate for that cylinder when it goes up. Mm -hmm. So the A-arm don't hit that cylinder. See, because when you have just a regular shock in there, you're not gonna have enough travel for that A-arm to get that far to lean in to hit that cylinder. Right, right, right. And even if it did, a shock just has a little bolt that comes up with a nut on it so the A-arm will clear the bolt. Mm -hmm. But once you remove the shock and put that cylinder in there, now the cylinder is sticking up six, eight inches over that A-arm and that A-arm has to have travel. When the car goes down, the front A-arms go up, okay? So when that, that A-arm has to have room 
to clear that cylinder in there because the cylinder doesn't move now, mm -hmm. okay? So when that A-arm car goes down and the A-arm goes up, it's going to hit that cylinder. Yeah. So you have to trim it out a little bit where it hit the cylinder. Okay. So it clears the cylinder. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think what, what a lot of people either don't remember or they don't talk about, or I've never seen it written down or even talked mm -hmm. about anywhere, is, are the hidden setups, mm -hmm. right? So when I was talking to Mark about this, he was saying that in the front, there was a way to not cut anything and you would use a, a shorter cylinder. So with that, I guess my first question is, on those shorter cylinders, does that avoid um, you kind of running the risk of hitting that cylinder with the, with the A-arm like you're explaining? Well, on the hitting setups that you're talking about, mm -hmm. you do those with no cutouts at all. Right. You still have to remove the shock but what you do is you mount the cylinder upside down now. Okay. So you make a bracket on the bottom A-arm to sit the cylinder in. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the stroke is pointing up. And the stroke is pointing up, and now everything is reversed. Now the spring is up on top. So now when you hit the switch, the stroke is still doing the same thing, but it's pushing the spring up instead of pushing it down, and you get the same effect except... The cylinder's on the bottom now, and you just have to have enough clearance and get the right kind of cylinder to where it doesn't hang down too far under the A-arm to where it scrapes on the bottom of the car, and then you still have to run your hoses down there. Right. So the hose is running closer to the street then? Yes. Right, because the, the fitting is right there? Yes, because the fitting's on the top. So yeah. you have to run a shorter cylinder for the hang down, and you run a longer spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the only disadvantage to the no cutout system is you're not going to get that much lift but it will lay now that's crazy i know you never <laughs> so i know we'll, we'll get into why i'm bringing this up but <laughs> okay so so you have your your hidden cylinder in the front then mm -hmm. you're running the hoses through the frame mm -hmm. right most of the time mm -hmm. to the back most of the time the guys that did no cutouts even if they wanted to put you could still mount the pumps and the batteries in the in the trunk but that's not hidden right no right right, right, right. but the, but the guys that really did the hidden ones, they would mount their pumps in, inside the front, like inside the radiator, or it, it would depend on the car. Like a lot of cars, man, like those Lincolns and those Caprices, you had a lot of room yeah, in between the grill good. and the radiator support. You, you, you had enough room to put a pump and dump and everything, and even some of the older cars, the guys, they would put one or two batteries up there somewhere in between the fender well up there. So that's the complete hidden ones where there's nothing in the trunk. Yeah. All of the components are up front under the hood somewhere. Batteries, hoses, dumps, cylinders, everything. Even the cylinders in the back, the hoses still run through the frame right. and right. connect to the cylinders under the car. And there's no cutouts. You open the trunk, there's no cutouts because everything is reversed. Yeah, so so talk about that. Explain that. How do you... I know it as flip cylinders, mm -hmm. right? That's how Gary Reed uh, yeah. taught me how to, how to put them in, into my father-in-law's car. Yeah. Um, so the hoses are running through the frame to the mm -hmm. back, mm -hmm. and then how, explain how that goes. Well, it's exactly the same. You have to make a spring perch to hold the cylinder upside down, and then it hangs down, and you have your fittings and stuff. You hook up the hoses from the bottom instead of the top. Everything goes up on top. The cup, the spring, everything goes up on top. Now that the cylinder's on the bottom, you don't have to do you don't have to do any cutting up there. So everything is on the bottom. That's so clean, man. And I. Who I, that? I, you know, I know who, who started doing that. Do you remember anybody? Who, like, when was the first time you saw that? Andy and his little brother Ralph. They they were did it to them. Ralph Lincoln. It was a '73 Mark Five Lincoln. That's wild. And they even had special wheels made for that car. I think they had 12 inch wires made for it. <laughs> oh really? That sucker laid like wow. crazy, man. Zeniths or what? What were they? Remember? I don't remember because it was a while before people started running Zenas because Zenas were, dude, Zenas yeah. were like four thousand dollars a set just the wheels. Things evolved. People started making more money. They started going. I remember the 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 first wires that came in that were big, affordable were the true spokes. And Andy's store sold a lot of true spokes. And then the True Classics came in, okay? And then there was all other kind of copies then. There, there were different wheel companies to copy, but I'm trying to remember the Zenits, if I can remember, up in the San Jose area, they were the first 
top top chef wheels. Yeah. Zenith. And they were made right over there in Campbell by a dude that on the name Jim Craig. And people think it's a wheel shop. It's not a wheel shop. It's a machine shop that makes wheels. Okay. You have to go in there and order your wheels. And they make them for you. You don't just go in there and just there. They, they got them up on the shelf and you buy them off the shelf. You go order your wheels and they put your wheels together. Damn. Yeah. I can't even imagine what a 12 inch <laughs> wire wheel looks like, man. Dude, what kind of tire do you even run on that? They, they had, it wasn't a 520, but it was a, it was a little small. It looked like a, a, a trailer tire. That's okay. crazy. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that thing was clean, man. Right. And there was no cutouts on the car. No cutouts. Yeah. no cutouts, no batteries in the back, no, no pump, no nothing. No. So I remember some people were telling me that a lot of times you would do that because when the cops would pull you over and want to look in your trunk, mm -hmm. you know, they'd be confused because nothing was back there, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, the cops were pretty cool uh, with us. Now, like I said, I really got into the hydraulics and the actual thing about hydraulics and lowriders when I moved to Fresno and I started working and I started uh, getting uh, with the guys doing the guys cars and it's all it's all innovation man every time you do a car by the time you're done you are, you already have an idea of what you're going to do on the next car better mm -hmm. or different and I've always been around cars I've I always my grandfather and father they're all mechanical engineers so my brother well, I, I always been around cars my dad and grandfather they owned the garage for forever where they worked on cars that was their business so I've always been around mechanically inclined people and I was always uh, super impressed about how about the system of hydraulics on a vehicle how you can make a car that weight do that much with just a flick of a switch. That always fascinated me. So I always wanted to learn yeah. more yeah. and more and more about how it worked and what was safe, the safest thing. That was my thing then, the safest, because, uh, man, the cars used to have all them batteries and fluid leaking in the trunk, dude. That's a bomb on top of a gas tank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> dude, yeah. that, that, that would be... Uh, uh, homeland uh, security crap now, man. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And that's what the cops, the cool cops, they used to pull us over and they used to look in the trunks. That's what they used to tell us. I remember them saying, we're not trying to keep you guys from having fun, but you guys need to understand this fluid is flammable. It's sitting on fabric. These batteries have acid in them. That's flammable. And it's sitting on a gas tank. Think about that, they would say. And, you know, when you think about that, you look at the logic of it, they're right. So that's why you should try and be as safe as you possibly can with that stuff in your trunk. And even then, it's still dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah, one spark is all it takes, right? That, one, that, that got me, too. Yeah, uh, the one spark got me, too. Four brand new batteries, and I'm charging the batteries. With the lids off, then you had to, you. They didn't have sealed batteries. You had to fill the batteries then. And I got all the lids off of my all brand new batteries, all brand new assets. And I'm charging them. And I go out there and I don't turn the charger off. And I take one of the cables off and the sparks and all of the fumes from the acid, all four batteries just exploded. Boom! Acid all in my face. I only did that once. <laughs> That's all it takes. <laughs> that was on the on the. Uh... I was on the Grand Am. On the Grand Am. And I was in the hospital again. Get, get my eyes flushed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I had to buy all brand new batteries. So, yeah, man, you, you learned. Most of our stuff was trial and error. Cracking blocks, running too many batteries, solenoids getting stuck, pumps running constantly, cracking the blocks. It was just all trial and error because no one had the forethought of researching what we were doing. Right. We, we, it was just all field tested stuff. That's almost like the beauty of what you just said, though, about taking the, the engineering behind hydraulics, like something that doesn't belong in a car, and having this culture that you were part of, like this, these young folks that were thinking about this and putting them into cars. And now look at where we're at now, right? And, and things are just so much better in terms of the safety uh, component. Obviously, they're still dangerous. But, yeah, I think that's really important for folks to realize that there's all this engineering that happens and you know, you're field testing it, you're making mistakes 
you're learning from the mistakes. Man, I I would have loved to have sit down with the old dudes in the barrio that first did what what Andy said. Hey, why don't we try and put this stuff on 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 cards? Because back then, from what I understand, what I was told from the old dudes I got to talk to down there, uh, they were using washing machine timers uh, for the switches and stuff like that. To, uh, uh, tapping the wires together to make the the pumps run and just listen to some of the stuff that they did. I would love to been around them when those guys are just sitting around and say, "Hey, why don't we try and do this to car? Something that's never been done before." Yeah. You know who who thought of, "Hey, you know, let's try and make these cars move." You know because but back then when I was coming along, man, you get a car, you want to do something, you heat the springs, you let it fall down on the ground, and if it goes too low, old, tough, you got to go buy some new springs. <laughs> you know, got to get under the torch and heat them. In it. But just the idea of, of making a car have that much response from a flick of a switch, just a flick of a switch, that always fascinated me, dude. To this day, that still fascinates me what they're doing with hydraulics now. But it was uh, my buddy, uh, one of my buddies down it, it, still my buddies, we, we, had a shop there where we were doing hydraulics in it. And that's all we did. We were right next door to a painting body shop, which I was friends with. So it was easy for us to do from hydraulics. If guys come in, they need a painting body, we do that. But but it always fascinated me. And, and I always looked forward at, I could not wait for the next innovation, what 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 was going to come out next to make it better? What was going to come out uh, a different to make it better? And man, where uh, these guys have gone with it now, but through the information, because now you can contact manufacturers mm -hmm. and custom order something. Yeah. I I want a pump that I make this car hop eight, 18 feet off the off the ground, and you can get it, and it's all compact now. Right. And you can get everything special made. I'm really impressed with some of the stuff that I'm that I see done now and I just think back at some of the stuff that we used to have to do man it used to take a month maybe two months to lift the car then <laughs> it depended on what kind of supply of parts they had when Andy went down there Andy was the only one doing it too yeah. but all of my friends down there in Fresno now they all came from when Andy's opened up down there mm -hmm. and all of my Real friend, true friends, low low right friends, everything was built from my time down there when I went down there to work for him. And it was really weird because when I left San Jose in 77, I guess it was around 77 when I left, we went down there. I lived on the east side. Mm. I lived on McKee Road, right down the street from James Lick uh, high, high School there. And all of the people working and poor people lived together, black, white. Mexicans, everybody lived together. And it wasn't that many Asians then, man. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was very few. But we all lived together. We all lived and did the same thing together, even when we started low right now. I, I mean, everybody was together. I moved to Fresno in 78. Everybody's doing the same thing, but they're separate. The Mexicans over here, the black people over here. And that tripped me out. When I got down there, because it's funny because when Andy opened the shop down there, there were only Mexican people coming into the shop. Young Chicanos were coming into the shop. And they were even shocked when they come in the shop and saw a black guy running the shop. And I, I never correlated that until her brothers, who were our competition, they were low riding in Fresno at the time when we were low riding up here doing the new style stuff and they would come up to the car shows every year at the fairgrounds and we were always in competition. And then I found that out when I moved down there and I found out about her brothers. We got the, we found, they found out that I was the one that moved down there and then we just became friends. And then when we became friends, that's when her brothers told me, you know, and I asked them, I said, hey man, it's weird for, it's a weird feeling for me when the people come in the shop. I said, and it's mostly Chicanos coming in the shop. Where's all the white low, where's all the black low riders? You know, her brother said, oh, there's a bunch of them. They live on the west side of town down there. And I'm like, don't they come in? And he said, no, he said it was, it was even 
hard for the Chicanos that I know to come into the shop because they didn't understand how a black guy was running a lowrider shop. And I said, well, that's weird for me because where I come from, we all live together. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Andy's a white dude, married to a Mexican. You know, mm -hmm. it's, we all live together. And they say, no, man, that's not how it is down here. And it took about wow. a year before one black lowrider came into that shop down here. And the only reason he did that, I found out later, was one of the main guys on the west side, car guys over there, came in one day and he saw my car parked out there. It was the same car, but by then, it was the same uh, Grand Am, but by then it was painted white pearl with candy pinstripe on it, with wires on it, and I would always drive it to work. And the one black guy came in one day, he was just driving by and he stopped, mm -hmm. and he decided to come in and he walked in the shop and he said, Hey, man, I need to talk to the Mexican guy that owns that car out there. <laughs> and I said, I own that car. And he said, nah. I said, yeah, I own that car. He goes, dude, that's a Mexican's car. I said, no, that's my car. Wow. He said, you do hydraulics? Uh, yeah, I'm the one that runs the shop. He goes, no, he really, he could not believe it. And then he went back to the west side and he let all the other guys know, hey, that's a black dude up there running. And then everybody started to come. Wow. Yeah. Over that's, a year. That's crazy to, to think about how San Jose, I guess, because I've heard this before where it was very mixed in in San Jose. Like everybody was doing it. Clubs were all mixed cultures. Um, I mean, even the, some of the, the footage I've seen in documentaries and interviews, it's like, you know, there was like Asian people in New Style, um, which is awesome right and i think that's kind of just speaks to the the area that we're that we're in but the you're culture. telling me you know completely Dude, different just two hours away right? completely different down there and everybody here when uh, we started new style and we started cruising king and story was a night spot hell your park was a day spot for all the picnics and where everybody gathered and stuff that was the hangout down there in fresno there's two parks like that that's the same equivalent to Hellier. One of them is, is Roading Park, and it's right off of the freeway, right in the central part of the town, Roading Park. And then there's Kearney Park, which is way out in the country. And the difference is Roading Park is in the city, and Kearney Park is in the county. So you could drink liquor at Kearney Park. So that's where all of the low riders used to have their functions out there. The individuals would have their picnics out there every year because you could drink liquor. And the cops were cool. As yeah. long as you didn't start no shooting, stuff like that, I, I mean, you could hop in contests, scrape your car, do whatever you want. The cops were cool. But down there in Fresno, Roading Park is in the sit in the middle of the city. Huge park, beautiful park. They got a zoo. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Roading Park down there. Beautiful park. They got a zoo, a giant zoo, a world-renowned zoo inside the park. And the whole park is, you can drive throughout the whole park. They got picnic areas. They got tennis courts. They got basketball courts on one side of the park. They even have a little lake in there where the kids go feed the ducks. And they got the paddle boards. And they got a little amusement park and everything on there. That's where everybody go down there. All the little riders used to go down there on the weekends. Sunday was the biggest day was a major cruise day. Mexicans cruise on one side of the park. They own that whole side of the park. The blacks own the other whole side of the park. That was strange to me. Mm. Because when I used to went down there and I started cruising with her brothers, I would go on the Mexican side and all the Mexican dudes would look at me like, you're on the wrong side, dude. You know, like, you're on the, and it was her brothers. No, no, this is a guy that runs and this is a guy that runs Andy. Oh, oh really? And, and then the black dudes would see me on that side, and they're like, "Hey, man, what are you doing over there, man? You gonna get, you gonna get some stuff started?" I went, "Man, I know all of these dudes. They come in the shop all the time." Oh, oh, really? Yeah, and that was just strange for me. And it took a long time before that got integrated, but the low, but the low rider culture inter integrated that park down there. Wow. To Probably to where, it yeah to to where everybody started mingling, you know, and then it's like, yeah, yeah, man, but man. Those, those, 
those Mexican dudes, man, they're cool people. I'm trying to tell you guys need to get to know these people. And then they start, and it changed everything, dude. And, and, and it changed everything. Most, the majority of my friends to this day down there in Fresno are Mexicans. Yeah. Because that's who I dealt with the whole, for the first two years I was down there. That's all, that's all I dealt with. And every last one of them to this day, matter of fact, we were just over one of, uh, one of my friends, one of the original members of the individuals down there, one of the founding members. He owns his own business. We were over there the other day. She and I was over there the other day just visiting with them and uh, it's just weird. We we was just talking about about all the old times and stuff, and that's what we used to say down there. Low riders don't die; they just get old, and they start building riding Harleys with their kids. Yeah. <laughs> but other than that, man, I I just sit back now and I look at some of the stuff that's going on, and I'm really in in awe of how much it progressed to. Think back to how we used to be digging through those crates, looking for dumps and fittings and hoses and stuff. And now, some somebody that can't even spell lowrider, that has never even heard the word lowrider, can walk into a shop and if he has enough money, can leave with a full dressed lowrider, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. just from where it's come to where it is now. I think that's a perfect closing statement right there. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me. I mean, I'm glad it all worked out that you were able to be in town when, you know, I had some free time. And I just appreciate all the knowledge that you've shared with me on Instagram and, and right now and, and that footage that you took. I mean, it's just uh, an incredible wealth of knowledge that you have. So thank you so much, Jerry. Man, I appreciate the honor. It was an honor meeting you. I appreciate what you're doing to the movement and trying to sustain the Chicano pride that a lot of people don't realize what goes into this. That's what I tell my wife and I tell my kids all the time. The blacks, the Asians, the, any other color or race of people, they can do this if they have the money. Mm -hmm. We do this. To the Chicanos, this is, the, this is them. You know what I'm saying? We can we can do it to any level, but this is part this is just part of their culture. Like I say, I'd love to go back and talk to the first dudes that even thought about doing that to a car. Yeah. I would love to just sit down and just pick those dudes brain too. Yeah. But yeah, it's an honor to have been a part of this movement that is continuing now. It's worldwide now, man. Yeah. God dang, it's worldwide. And it's so much money involved in a billion and billion dollar industry from my point of view, from one guy, Andy, saying, hey, we should open up a shop to do this, to sell this stuff. People don't want this stuff. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having me.